So one of the big things we need to do outside of the technical tradecraft of running these scans is triaging vulnerabilities. This is very, very important to the organization. We need to triage the validity of these vulnerability disclosures. A non-authenticated scan is going to be least reliable because it can only do so much in evaluating if that system is vulnerable or not. It didn't have credentials to use to then connect and evaluate fully in that session that the vulnerability truly exists. We then have authenticated, right? So that alludes to, well, we can provide that service account and we can get a more reliable read on the vulnerability validity because it was able to go through more steps and do more evaluation. Again, getting to the agent is probably our most reliable because it's assessing the software as it's configured and deployed and running. So instead of having to tease information out through a non-authenticated network scan or an authenticated network scan, we get right to the meat and potatoes and can look at the software and say, hey, what are you doing? How are you configured? How do you operate? And, you know, hey, there's a vulnerability here. We didn't have to, like, second guess through all these other means to get that data. And the most reliable being that hybridized. You're getting corroboration from your non-authenticated, authenticated, and agent-based solution. You're getting that cross-reference of data that just essentially improves the confidence of your vulnerability analysis, right? If you just run a non-authenticated scan, hey, that's good awareness, but when you're coupling that with authenticated and an agent, you're getting all of these different scanning techniques to validate and cross-reference each other to say, like, yes, this is a vulnerability. It's been evaluated through three different scanning techniques, and it's legitimate. Once we go through that validity of, of verifying that the vulnerability truly does exist on the machine, we now need to prioritize those vulnerabilities because... We can have multiple vulnerabilities with the same essential CVSS score. We need to understand the sensitivity of that asset, right? That remembers we need to know the business unit that it's tied to. What are the goals of that business unit? How does that business unit impact the organization? If we don't understand how our company makes money and how they operate, how can we assess the sensitivity of an asset, right? So we have to go through that whole process. Here's one that is really unique the ability for that asset to communicate with other networks or devices. We might have an asset that's in the cloud that can only talk to other systems in that network. So it's very hard for it to communicate outside. So even though we might have a valid exploit that's a high severity on that asset, it can't talk to anything on the internet. So when we look at two, say, CVSS score 10s, which is the highest level of, of severity, if I have one machine that is a CVSS score 10 that is connected to the internet and is accessible over the internet versus one that's in a data center or the cloud that is only internally accessible, we obviously want to triage and remediate the one that is internet accessible first. We do all the internet accessible ones, ones that can be compromised through remote code execution, and then we'll go to the ones that are internal to our network and start remediating them. But again, that is not always easy to make that call because like I said before, just because a system is critical and it can't communicate to the internet does not mean the other systems that it talks to can't get to the internet. What if an adversary took advantage of a medium level vulnerability on an asset and then was able to then pivot and talk to that internal critical asset with that vulnerability? That's what happens a lot during penetration testing. You hire a company to do a pen test of your organization. They find an attack vector that works getting them into the network, usually social engineering and phishing. They send a malicious email. And lo and behold, once they're in the network, they find a bunch of high vulnerable or high severity CVSS scored vulnerabilities inside the network. And these assets and systems traditionally do not communicate to the outside network. So it makes sense that some of them aren't patched because they just haven't gotten to them yet. And they're, of course, fighting the good fight, trying to protect all of their assets that talk to the internet. However, in this pen test, or even if you're a hacker, you now have systems that are vulnerable inside the network that you can take advantage of. So we've got to move fast in testing our patches, deploying our patches, validating our patches, identifying new vulnerabilities, having good scanning methods and techniques to identify these things and account and take care of them quickly. One thing to note, when you look at most compliance standards, they're all going to require a vul vulnerability management process is being conducted within the organization. PCI DSS, 
Sarbanes-Oxley, SOC, a lot of these require that at a minimum the organization is aware of their vulnerabilities they have a process to triage vulnerabilities they have a process to patch vulnerabilities so everything we've been talking about are pretty much standard you gotta have them to be compliant and a lot of these compliance frameworks mandate the schedule of the scans so we see here that they could be weekly monthly quarterly or depending on policy so there's some policies that will mandate just scan once a year. There's some that are like, hey, every do it every six months. And there's some that are continuous scanning. You need to be scanning weekly. You need to be remediating and mitigating vulnerabilities that are discovered through your asset configuration management and patch management practices. So there's a lot that needs to be done that are outlined in compliance frameworks when it comes to all of the things we've been talking about, that asset compliance, patch, and vulnerability management. You've got to have those working or you're just not going to be compliant. And again, just it's worth bringing up again that triaging and prioritizing remediation can be very, very challenging. We've talked a lot about it, but it's worth mentioning again how severe is the detected vulnerability, right? There can be many of the same severity or you can have one high severity and the rest could be lower informational. So it might be easy in that instance to prioritize which ones we do in what order. How easy is it to exploit the vulnerability? So the CVSS scoring, as we said before, gives some insight into that, but this is also where it's required of the security practitioner, the analyst, when they identify this vulnerability, they do the research. That could be reading threat intelligence, open reports, blogs. There's unfortunately a lot of people get their information from Twitter that leads to these blog posts and sources. However you get that information, you need to identify, is there an exploit in the wild and how hard is it to do? Could some you know, high school kid uh, go look on YouTube and in 15 minutes be up and running and attacking systems, not really fully understanding what they're doing? That is extremely critical vulnerability when it's at that level of skill can compromise a machine. And a lot of these we've talked about before, so I'm not going to belabor the point again, but you know, we've got to know who owns the systems, what's their risk assessment, can we do the patches, can the system be patched? All of these things create friction in the patch management and vulnerability management process. And it gets a lot harder when you're at a very large organization. In a smaller organization, you might be expected to do vulnerability management, alert triage, responding to incidents. You're doing a lot of different tasks because it's a small team. In a very large organization, they will have a person who is solely dedicated to vulnerability management. It is their full-time job throughout the year to be discovering vulnerabilities, triaging vulnerabilities, working with different business units to get these patched and updated and, and up to spec so that the organization is not compromised. So it really just depends on the organization you work for, how big they are, what market or vertical they support, which will dictate you know the compliance requirements you need to meet, how often you gotta scan, and what you need to do to be in compliance. So vulnerability management in cloud computing brings out a whole new set of issues in relation to being aware of vulnerabilities because cloud computing has been around for quite a while now well over a decade but a lot of organizations are still new to it and there's a lot of organizations still rolling out and adopting cloud computing and you don't get in a lot of the same sense the same visibility and control you'd have on a network you own because the cloud computing is just computing resources or using a computer that somebody else owns. When you go to Amazon Web Services and deploy your software, you're using Jeff Bezos' computer. You're using Amazon's computer. And there's a limit to the visibility and control they give you of that asset. One of the key things you need to be aware of is what's called DevOps or development operations. And we're not going to really dive too much into DevOps in this course, but DevOps is the process of working with developers to build software and then deploy the development operations is the act of deploying code and software to a production network and to get it up and running and installed and so that it's an actual you know application that's running the process is is there's a lot of things that need to happen in that workflow to make sure that stuff is secure so vulnerability management needs to integrate with that devops workflow when an, a programmer makes an update to their code it then gets compiled, it gets scanned, it gets tested, and then it gets deployed. So if we're not doing vulnerability scanning or assessing vulnerabilities in any of those phases or workflows, 
we're completely blind to the process of deploying that software to the cloud and what vulnerabilities it represents. So getting vulnerability management integrated into DevOps, particularly when it comes to cloud computing and deploying, deploying stuff into the cloud, it's critical. A lot of cloud vulnerability management focuses on finding vulnerabilities in the services themselves. So let's think about this for a minute. It's not a traditional computer with networks and ports and services most of the time. You're accessing a service and the service you have limited control you can do some configuration on how that service is set up to work with your organization but that's where a lot of vulnerability management and vulnerability identification occurs with the cloud we want to look at the identity and access management how are roles and accounts being used and authenticated in our cloud how are these roles and policies and service accounts applied to the services within our cloud account right so how are these permissions being used and or abused in our cloud estate because going after the cloud is really really lucrative for a lot of attackers who want to use things like crypto mining they would love to compromise your cloud account because you have tons of compute resources that's really easy to spin up in the cloud and if they compromised your cloud account they can generate a lot of money by using your cloud resources to generate uh, bitcoin or crypto currencies We've got to be aware of how these services communicate with one another. And a lot of services and administrators and developers communicate with services and other systems through APIs or application programming interfaces. They provide an endpoint to interact with a piece of software and it creates sort of like a standard protocol in what I can send to an application and how it will respond to me. The abuse of APIs allows people to enumerate information that wasn't inherently expected or prepared for by the people who created the API. And in a perfect example to bring that point home was at the height of the COVID-19 issue, there was a big kerfuffle around the use of Zoom. And a lot of people started dropping Zoom, the teleconferencing solution, because essentially some, some bad hackers out there figured out that they can enumerate against the API and start guessing meeting invite IDs. And because there's an API, they were able to programmatically start sending randomized meeting uh, keys and seeing when the API responded that, hey, this is valid, this is a valid meeting. So using an API, or I, say, I would say abusing an API, they were able to find rooms that weren't protected and they were able to jump in on those calls and listen in, which you know made a lot of people very nervous about using that platform. Essentially at the end of the day, it was because people did not do a risk assessment of using Zoom. They didn't do vulnerability management and how their Zoom account should be configured because every user of Zoom was able to configure their accounts to not fall victim to that type of an attack. But the problem also lies in that Zoom did not configure your system or make you obviously aware that that could be an issue. So it's, it's a little bit of the service provider wasn't thinking forward about you know the security of their system. But at the end of the day, it's our responsibility as security practitioners that when we use services for production use for our company, we need to think like that. We've got to go through the tools and systems and assess them. What is the risk of using a tool such as Zoom if we left it completely in an unconfigured state? Does it meet our standards or does it not? Are we able to configure it to meet our standards or not? And if we can't configure it to meet our standards, well, then that's not a solution we should use. Last but not least, patch and vulnerability management work really, really well when you have asset and configuration management uh, to be really effective. And it's And it's not to say that you can't you can be effect you can't be effective without those it just makes it considerably easier to get your vulnerability management processes humming along and like i said before if it takes you longer to identify assets scan assets identify vulnerabilities triage vulnerabilities that's that much more time an adversary has to abuse those vulnerabilities so having good asset management and configuration management ensures that you're handling these vulnerable systems in a timely manner. And again, it works both ways. Doing vulnerability analysis and collecting vulnerable data helps validate your assets. Hey, there's new assets we identified. Let's add that to the asset tracker because we ran a network scan and we found new things. Or we found some devices that we thought were configured that weren't. So 
by doing all of these processes, we're always validating or invalidating our previous assumptions. And that's essentially what cybersecurity is about. It's validating and invalidating assumptions. We are testing, retesting, drawing new hypotheses and evaluating them over and over again. Every time we build a process to repeat something, we should be doing something else that can help ensure that that process is working as intended. And we can do that through vulnerability scanning across the network. We can do that in a hybridized approach. We can do that through authenticated and unauthenticated means or even an agent. So regardless of what solution you use, You've got to work with what you have and start building out your management process. The best, of course, is going hybridized, but that costs more money. Even if you're doing authenticated and non-authenticated scanning, that's still really effective in identifying assets, verifying configurations, and identifying network-based vulnerabilities that need to be remediated.